Hello, my esteemed viewers, and welcome to the program Talk Talk on Living TV. My name is Chibu GK Mwagli, and today I'm so honored to have as a guest the Social Democratic Party SDP governorship candidate, and that is Honorable Dem Blessing Mwaba, PhD. Honorable, you're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. We heard her from her. And today we have a very important discussion to have with her because she's going to tell the audience what she has for them. So I'm going to start right now. Honorable, you are the only woman in this race. What's the motivation? Well, the motivation for me is to transform Adam. The motivation is my conviction that I can bring transformation in Abia State. I can bring um, change in Abia State. That I am that change that Abia requires. I need to move Abia to another level where poverty is near eradicated, where happiness is brought back to the people, where um, infrastructural development is high, where economic revitalization becomes the order of the day, where employment is what you now have everywhere, where um, poverty, like I said, is near eradicated, where joy and happiness becomes the, the, the way for the people. So I came into the content because I have been in Abia and I realized there are a number of things Abias are dealing with. And that these are not things that can be transformed through rocket science. They are things that anybody who is committed to the cause of development, who is committed to the cause of change, who is committed to the plight of the people who comes on board would know how to go about. And I am that person that has packaged myself, packaged ideas, packaged a program it is going to turn Abia around come 2019. All right, just like you said, you package a little for Abians. I think we have to move into economy. I'd like to know your economic blueprint for Abians. Actually, how you can actually make Abia less dependent on national revenue and, of course, make it more dependent on the IGR. Yes, please. That is very key. Um, economically, Abia can thrive. Economically, Abia can be very independent. Economically, Abia can feed other states. You know, you know that Abba is known to be the Japan of Africa. Yeah, that's obvious. You know that Abians are known to be very industrial, hardworking, yeah, that's true. ingenious. You know that um, so many things that are produced in Abba, not just the leather and leather products, even um, mechanical things go to portacotry, machines, um, generators, and all of that are also worked on. There's hardly anything you bring to ABA that ABA cannot copy and produce. So, this ingenuity is what drives the economy of ABA, of ABA people and ABA in general. And what we need to do is to give them a conducive environment. What are these conducive environments? One, you give them good roads to drive their cars on. Again, you give them electricity to power their productivity. Then you give them security to ensure that they feel safe to work both day and at night. Then you give them institutions that are going to help to train those, train their children, train their drive this economy. Institutions, I mean, are you ensure that their children go to good schools. You ensure that they have good hospitals to take care of them. They are health problems when they have health issues. Because if you are working, you know, into pro you're, you're into production and you don't have good hospital to go to, you are you, you are hindered, you are bothered, you don't you won't put in your best. So it's, it's a it's an all round thing. So it is important that for you to drive the economy of Abu, you give them those basic drivers give them good roads, give them very basic, basic infrastructure, give them electricity, give them security. And when all of these are done, people are encouraged to not put in their best in production. Again, you want to see that those um, markets where people trade, where uh, economic activity is so much, or is um, go, a lot of economic activities are going on, that you, you rebuild those markets make it very conducive too for the traders and for people who are coming. You know that prior to now, you have people from Cameroon, have people from 
um, beyond this country, other countries, even Ghana, coming to Abba to purchase things. And that was because the shops were okay. That was because you had security. That was because they were less harassed. But today, you, can, you see a situation where people are coming into Abia, they are harassed by so-called tax collectors from the state. You know, their vehicles are vandalized, they are harassed, they are molested. There should be a more, a saner or more modern way of collecting revenue without harassing people so that uh, people will feel free to come into the state. Then, in our government, we intend to have revenue collection agents that will be civilized, that are, you know, that are, would I say, people friendly. And because we're also going to deliver, people will be encouraged to pay their taxes even without stress. But then beyond that is the fact that you're going to get revenue collection agents that have civility, that have understanding, that have humane, you know, faces, and not those that would um, harass people on the road so that people are now scared to come into Abia State for business. So these are ways you want to encourage business in Abia State. But then beyond that again is agriculture. What are we doing about agriculture? Uh, Abia State has a lot of land. Go to the interior beyond, I mean outside have a lot of land. Yeah. So why don't we develop an agri agricultural sector and then we have an agri, agri value chain where you have those who are producing, those who are storing, those who are marketing, those who are doing one thing or the other in the whole, in the whole chain. And it, uh, along the line, there's employment created because people are driving these things at every of the stages. So these are the things I and my government have programmed to do to see that we revitalize um, the economy of Abiyans. All right, you talked about uh, um, maybe a, a tax drive, a friendly tax driving agency mm -hmm. that will actually work better than what we have right now in mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know, how do you intend more than this set of persons? Where do you think to manufacture this sort of person that will be this friendly? Because that is, the, the thing here is that for you to pick it up from the people, it has to be the harsh way. No, it doesn't have to be the harsh way. It's working in other places, so why not add it? You, you've been to Lagos State, haven't you? Yeah, I've been. You've been to Lagos State. People pay taxes for because the government is delivering. Once, I'm coming to your question, though, uh, how you're going to pay the people. But beyond that is that people pay taxes because you see the dividend of the taxes. You're paying, you see the dividend of government. So when you pay your tax and the roads are done for you, you are giving electricity, you are giving security, you are, giving, you are getting the benefits of democracy. You would want to go and pay. The next tax. So, um, first of all, we are going to run a transparent government, a government that is going to deliver, a government that on its own encourages people to go and pay their taxes. But outside that is that because we have seen this work in other places, we are going to get into partnership with them. Those Wait, governments. Sorry, not question. Are you talking about public-private partnership in the tax drive? Or? No, 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 no. I'm not talking about public-private partnership now. Okay. We are going to liaise with the government where this thing has worked where taxes are collected without molestation. We are going to have some of their workforce come and educate, come and teach our people how to go about it. Okay. Um, you know, there's something in our society. This fussy way of collecting taxation now is like the order of the day. But when there's a reorientation, when you make efforts to reorientate the minds of people, which is the key thing in governance, things will just begin to change on their own. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when you now bring people who are going to reorientate the minds of Abians, reorientate the minds of those who are going to position, you will discover that this is this start working. You will get some Abians into it. It will also get those who are not Abians, who have made it work in their own places, to partner with us and to work. All right, that's honorable then. Blessing Mwaba, PhD, talking to you, telling you how she's going to make our economy fare better. And don't forget, this is Living TV, and the program is Top Top. We'll go to security now. Abia enjoys relative peace, but we we'll still think we can do better. So, what security measures are put in place to make Abians enjoy better security under your purview? Thank you once again. Security is very key in everything, in development. Where there is no security, there cannot be development. Where there is no security, there cannot be night life. Where there is no security, there cannot be economic turnaround. So, because we know that, 
we are going to ensure that we have um, community policing. Because we say that there is no in your vicinity, most people know themselves. In every community, most people know themselves. You also know the criminals. So when you are made to be your own police, you discover that you will on your own detect and bring out those people who are criminals in your environment. It is easier to handle. And when you bring strangers, bring a northern to come and handle you. He doesn't know the, the, the appear with it. He doesn't know the way through with these uh, uh, criminals, uh, criminals escape and uh, uh, prison escape. So we are going to um, get into community policing where the people become their own police. They will now liaise with the federal securities and other agencies and ensure that crime is reduced in every community, in every district, in every locality as it were. That is all we're trying to do. Okay, you and then, because, me. let me also let you know, there's no child that is born that is like born a criminal. Do you know that? Sure, that's sure. It is society that produces the children that we have. It is society that produces the, 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 the criminal that we have. And a sociologist. So I understand that as far as society is concerned. If you give, what you give to society is what you get. So if we ensure that we produce, that we give employment to our citizens, we give great employment for our young ones, the number of persons who are going to indulge in crime will be highly reduced. So we are going to ensure that we create jobs through agriculture, that we create jobs through um, revitalization of industries, that we create jobs through many other means. When that is done, crime itself will reduce. And when that is reduced, with the community policy we are going to engage in, and in liaison with other security agencies, crime will be seriously reduced in our society. All right, don't go nowhere. We're going to be back in a jiffy. The program is talked of, and you are saying, Honorable Dem, Blessing Wawa, talking to you. Just hold on, I'll be back in a little while. TV bringing the word first to you first to you Welcome back to the program in State Talk Talk and I remain Chukudi Kemwagi and my guest hasn't changed it's still honorable them blessing more about honorable back to the program once again Thank you once again All right we are going to shift you were talking about uh, how to get youths involved through agriculture. I think that's not all you have for them. So I'd like to know the programs you've actually applied and put down, okay, to actually alleviate poverty, create employment, and of course, reduce crime as well. Thank you. I've spoken about agriculture. I've also spoken about industrialization. Yeah. Yes. Um, of course, it's uh, a known fact that many of our industries are non-functional. And uh, because of um, a number of policies created in our states, even the multinational corporations and some other industries, have even rather left Abia, have left Abba instead of bringing in new ones. So we are going to see that we create conditions, uh, conditions for these industries to want to stay in Abba. Abba is a very, it has a, it's a big market, it has a population. So all you need to do is to see that your tax policies are not punitive. If they are punitive, they will leave. Yeah. You give tax concessions to industry because you know that if industries are here, the cyclical effect is much on your economy. So they will pay taxes to your, to your state, so the state will then get taxes. Then they will also employ your citizens. And there will be cash flow because your people are employed. And it's a chain reaction, it's a cyclical thing. So we must see that we create policies that will be attractive to industries. So that not just that old industries will stay, but we will attract foreign direct investment. We attract other industries into Adria. We attract people who, you know there's not much like like Nice life, yeah, sure. Exactly. You know, you, you remember that in those days, you had so much nightlife. This anti abba most of the playwriters you have to do, most of the, um, Access you have to do, father in other. You know that. So we create such that industry. 
it creates, you, you see that entertainment industry is revitalized. So that you keep youth go there. They act, they do their themes, they display, and so much is done. And that's industry alone. You know that the entertainment industry is one industry that has created so much employment for Nigerians today. Yes, yes, you know yes, that. Yes. So Ababa was the origin of all of that. What happened? The economic, the, 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 the uh, insecurity became the order of the day. Yeah. Secondly, the economy just went down generally. So they were no longer making it, they, they produce things, you don't have people who will come to watch, so you cannot actually cover your cost of production of the things. So to me, all of this thing that happened discouraged that uh, industry, and people left Abia. But you are going to revitalize that uh, creative industry, and entertainment industry, which is one area that employs a lot of the youth. Um, we are also going to train our younger, our young ones. Like we have the uh, small and medium scale enter, um, enterprises. Right. They are there. Go to Ariaria, go to, you know, it, 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 all over the place you now, but they are there. All you need to do is to give them conducive environment, give, give them light, give them security. Then you also try to train them, support them. It's a kind of train the trainer program. Okay. Yes. And when that is done, you all—that is another sector that we also take employment. Okay. And then, on top of our women, we also train our women. We also engage them in agriculture. We we'll get them in craft skills, you know. And when you do all of this, you are going to be creating more employment. Then, on top of women in governance, why are women not in governance? Why do you not have more many women in politics? Why do you not have women in governance generally? Yeah. Our government is going to ensure that we bring many more women on board. Because we see women and people who are talented, people who are gifted, people who are naturally endowed to govern. Talk of a whole where there's no woman, the other is never the same. Talk of a society where the women are not active. Talk of the church. Pastor Tobin said, a church without the women is a dead church. Because they have a way of putting things together and organizing. The same thing happens in society. So once you have the women interested in governance, you help them, you encourage them. The days are gone when women were just to be seen and not heard. Women have a lot of intellect, intellectual capability. So we should encourage them to see that the teacher and bring to bear those their gifts, those their endowments. But it is the interest of the society, the interest of the husband, the interest of everybody. They add a lot to development. Alright, I am just going to take a little bit back to agriculture because uh, when I was growing up, I used to have people they call agri-station workers. Oh yeah. And then, uh, what do you have any plan for research and reorientation of our farmers? Because that's been the way it's been done. I know my mom, the way she's been planted since I was born, and still the same way. Those who don't come against start and this is the new breed of cassava. Do you have any plans for that for Abians? Yes, in fact, we have. It's in our blueprint. What our blueprint? Maybe I can show you our blueprint. Okay. I'd like to hear that well, from you. Well documented. Yes. You know. In our blueprint, we said that we're going to be partnering with um, research industry, research institutions. Okay. Okay. We have them in the UK. We have the... Um, uh, they are taking it by uh, uh, National Road for Research Institute. Exactly, they are there. There are a number of them at the UK. So you partner with them, they bring their latest research um, products into, into the society. They bring them to bear on those who are into agriculture. And really, with that, you can you have varieties of food, uh, crops that will produce, not just that they mature faster, they are also uh, more, they, they are more healthy when you use them, yeah. the organic and all of that. So we are going to partner with those research institutes to give us their best products and their most um, um, useful um, products. And yeah. we are going to pass that on to our agri uh, farmers. And of course that will bring a lot of change. All right, I think that that's, that's very understandable. Um, Honorable, we're going to move to health sector. Health, they say, is wealth. Uh, a healthy man is a wealthy man. Do you have anything to make our primary, secondary, and tertiary health sectors more efficient than what we have today? And of course, make the workers you know, happy to actually deliver? Yes. Health is wealth. And until you're, you're sick, you don't realize how much of wealth you have. When you're, he when you're healthy, you take it for granted. Yes. And when you're sick, you now discover that every wealth you have becomes meaningless. Okay. So for that reason, um, the health sector is very key in our agenda. 
in our transformation yeah. agenda. What we what have we programmed? We have programmed that our health institutions are going to be functional. We are going to refurbish, restructure, as we do physically, the buildings or the institutions, the, the structure of the institutional health institutions that we have. Okay. And to make them to make them conducive for the kind of care we should be giving out to our patients. Apart from the health institutions, the structure, the building themselves. Yeah, the clinics. Have, yes, we have also programmed that are going to train and retrain the health workers. What, are, what do you mean by that? We ensure that we get quality doctors into those hospitals. Okay. We are sure we are going to get um, trained nurses and other caregivers into those institutions. And we ensure that our primary health care is, is, is functional. Today they are not functional. We hear about one primary health care per work. For me, they are almost non-existent. I don't even see them. They're not really there. So it is important that we get those institutions um, functional um, and deliver. So when you have some ailments, like you have malaria, you don't have to start going to teaching hospitals. You don't have to go, start going to patient hospitals. You go to those basic ones. And they also handle um, environmental care. Because when, you, when, when the primary health care institutions are working, yes. then you, you, your environment is taken care of by ensuring that you don't have filthy and unconducive polluted environments that rather bring illness instead of bringing health, instead of having flowers planted around you, you have mosquito and water everywhere. So those are key things you must do. All these things are in place. Your primary health care system is functional, your environment is clean. You the, the health um, the health situation will be far more improved and the health of the people will be far more um, um, taken care of in a, in a better situation. So that you won't have much cost to now keep going to hospitals and all of that. And beyond that is that we must have the institutions well punished, we must get the right personnel, then there has to be um, order, there has to be um, kind of biometric, um, ensure that the biometrics are working. Okay. But people actually come to work. That's what I'm, I mean by that. Okay, okay, actually. Yes, yeah, so because that. you can still employ those people who don't come to work. That's that's very, very key. That's very key. But I'm looking at the, the tertiary uh, health sector in Abia State. I think we have uh, the absolute, and that's the, yes. the, the much we have. We have some other uh, For the tertiary institutions, one of our programs is to partner with the federal government. Because the federal government has a number of programs that would impact on the special institutions. Okay. There are also um, multinational organizations that add value to or that gives that subsidize and bring a number of things into these special institutions. You know? So it is for you to reach out and see that all those grants, all those sub support from international bodies, from the Cuban government, they come to bear on what you have in Abia State. That we also know they are going to be doing. All right, great news for Abia. Let's go to education. Of course, you know that's the bedrock. An uneducated mind can do anything. So, I want to find out from you, Onubo. How are you going to make Abian fair under your purview educationally? Because I am a product of a, a public primary school, public uh, secondary school, public university. Uh, back then, we used to have people who monitor what they start doing, but now it's not like that. So, what are you going to do differently to actually make this particular sector functional again? Yes, when I started this interview, I did say that the social institutions were key to making the life of Abians um, trans well, get transformed. If the hospitals are okay, if the schools are okay, and other social institutions are okay, Abians will be happy. So, dealing with the schools, um, first and foremost, you know as much as I do, that many of the institutions, the schools, I mean now, yeah. are not in their best of stage to deliver quality education to our children. In a situation where the children do not have roof over their heads, they do not have seats to sit on to be, to be taught, you know, they do not have um, they do not have um, secured environment. Why do I say so? Because I've seen them. I'm not just guessing. There are many schools in this state where the seats are not there, the roofs are not there, and the hoodlums live in those places in the night and sometimes in the day. So that when the children come to school, they first of all try to vacate in those empty classrooms. They think the hoodlums would have packed there in the night. And that was where they slept. I saw them. So those are the things you must take care of. 
we must ensure that the, 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 the buildings are okay, conducive, that the children have seats to sit on, that this environment is secured, that you won't you won't offense the schools, so that the teachers and the students of Putin feel secure to, 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 to teach and to learn. Then beyond that is the fact that the quality of education, the quality of um, um, the, 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 the material you teach, you know, is of high standard. How do you see that? The curriculum. What is there in the curriculum? Are you meeting up what to, what today's curriculum requires? Are you teaching what the, what is going to be of dividend to the, the to the pupils and to the students, or do you just teach them what is not maybe the, the, the lesson notes they prepared many years back when they were in school is what they are easy to teach? Are they following the curriculum? What is what is the curriculum? Is the lesson notes is anybody supervising them? You know, and all of that. Then beyond that is are those teachers trained and trained? You have to train and train the teachers. Yeah. Then what are the teaching aids? What are the materials they're using to teach them? How do you ensure that the, the, the pupils, the students actually learn what they are being taught? Because there are methods of teaching that will encourage the children to learn and learn faster. So these are the things you must look into. The supervision. Do you have people who are actually going to supervise? Who actually go to supervise? What those who go to collect money? I'm very much interested in this because I think that's what the problem is. Okay? I used to have back then, uh, we used to call them Indole School. Yeah, that's a money guy, please. I know you may not hear what I'm saying. I'm talking about the rest of please. Don't mind me. Um, they used to come and they come unannounced. Mm -hmm. I'll see our teachers running out of the schedule trying to make sure that everything is packaged. So how do you intend doing it? Because of this set of people, are you going to manufacture from another planet that will keep saying reorientation is key in anything we do. If only we sanitize the minds of our citizens, you will see that things will work out by themselves. You know, there used to be an agency called um, Reorientation. As a agency. National agency. Exactly, you knew that. What was their function? It was to condition the minds of citizens. Yeah. That thing is very, very important. We underrate their function. We underrate what they're supposed to do. If only we can reorientate the minds of our people and make them think positively and make them think productively, you know, and make them think positively in the interest of our society. You see that things will change. If somebody is employed as a, 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 as a an education officer, and your job is to go to survive the schools. You should actually go to survive the schools, and not do and not and not do what we call favoritism. Yeah. Partial. And maybe when you get there, and anyone who don't give you a kickback on, you you, you you recommend negatively again that one. Either the one that they give you something, they, they give you the, if it's any school they give you something that gives you something, then that yeah, is a good school. Even when you know that the school is poorly located, even when you know that the facilities and environments are very, very detrimental to what we are supposed to be achieving, yet you approve those schools. Those are problems. So we must retain the minds of our citizens to know that they must deliver and deliver well. Okay, what about the digital institution? Because I um I started a call that has to do with much practice, okay? But you see that the theories are much more than the practice because Abia has uh, Abia Poli, we have the Absu. What plans do you have to actually make those uh, practical oriented courses to actually be practical, not just theoretical the way it is right now? Yes. You know that um, if you go to Ghana, if you recall when Ghana had to come to Nigeria, when they had their economic crisis, yeah. every Ghanaian then, no matter the level of education, had an additional skill. I don't know how old you were then. Ghanaian, this was the 80s. Every Ghanaian that came into this country, it could be an engineer, it could be a doctor, they had a skill. The other skill could be hairdressing, the other skill could be messing room, the other skill could be in, in, I mean, electrical. Yeah. So that even though they had no formal employment, they were able to add value to the society and make a living. So those institutions you're talking about, like Abia Puna, is one that could bring that kind of thing to bear on our society, on our young ones. I didn't tell you that I recall that when I graduated, you know, in the 80s too, uh, there were no jobs or the kind of job I wanted. I chose not to go to do some kind of job. I, I wasn't really cut for civil service jobs. I didn't want to do civil service jobs. I rather really prepared to go and learn a trade. I learned how to do tailoring, fashion designing. That's I, great. Yes, I established. I, I like I like them to hear that the yeah. honourable you're hearing today once learned how to do tailoring, and that's encouraging. I saw that I had my master's degree. I had my master's degree. I didn't want to do some kind of... Uh, I just like things that were quite, quite more challenging. So I chose to go and learn fashion designing. I learned it very well. Also got a loan 
from um, then NGE. Okay. You know, was it NGE? Yes. You know that institution called NGE? Yeah, they, they used to be closed. Yeah. Exactly. You know, they gave us loans. We went to Abu Dhabi for the training. After, after they trained us, you went, did your, did your feasibility study, I got the loan. With that, I established my fashion business after I had gone for training. I yeah. like this. Yes. And that fashion business till tomorrow, I love. It's just that I got so busy that I can no longer do it. Every day I keep pushing, my fashion business was still there. Even when I was doing this house, I thought of opening a small store at the front where I can also be practicing my fashion design. Because it enables me to, to bring to bear my creative abilities into practicality. So, I'm saying that that institution called Abiyapu is one that could not just give you theoretical um, knowledge, but give you ability to practicalize most of the things that, can, uh, that, that you learn and also bring those things to bear on society. Like today, if you want to build your house, you're looking for somebody who can do POP for you. You're looking for a Karenia. You're looking for a Tuboli. Why? You want to do proper electrical work in your building. You're looking for somebody from outside this country. Why? Because many of our people do not want to go through those rudiments and those, that proper training you require to give a perfect job. Meanwhile, these things are in this country. The, 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 the opportunities are there. So I'm only saying that that institution called Adyapu should be restructured to add that value to our society as it was designed to add. People should be properly trained. The department should give the training the, 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 the children there require, the students there require, so they can come out of the society and add the value they, they're supposed to add. Therefore, um, then, well, let me even finish with this one here. They've not paid their salaries for a long time. That's what we know. Teachers are not paid. For me, if they are not delivering, they should be structured. No, it, uh, it, it, it is, what I mean by that, it, it is an institution that should pay for itself. Okay. They have grants, they collect revenues, they collect uh, school fees and other revenues from it. They get a uh, subvention from here and there. They also have grants. It's not for the state government to actually pay, you know, as it were. Even though they can also get grants from the state government. But I think there's something about leadership. A situation where so many people, you have, uh, like I heard, two gates, and you have 80 gates men. Money to gates. That's what I'm saying. So some things are the things that mass of institutions. In that case, reorganize that institution. Restructure it to fit. Restructure it to produce. And not allow it to just stay. You have to have the real power. You have to have the political power to restructure these institutions that are, that are not functioning. That's lovely. Yes. That's lovely. Honorable, I've taken you a long, long, long talk. I'm sure you are getting somehow stressed out. I hope you're not stressed out with my All right. I'm so happy. But somehow my patience is just whining that I'm going to infrastructure, which is what every Abian has been crying for, begging for someone to come to Macedonia, come to Abia and save us. And we believe uh, somebody in your capacity has what it takes to do this. If you're going to tell us, because I'm not going to want to talk about this, Abia has been crying for electricity, good roads. We've seen roads, but we need standards. What are your plans infrastructurally for Abians? Thank you very much. When we talk of infrastructure, majorly in this state, we talk of roads. There are more, there's more to infrastructure, but the first thing that strikes your mind is roads. Let me talk. Let talk. We have the major roads in the cities, we have the rural roads. The rural roads are supposed to be majorly the, 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 the responsibility of the local governments. But you also know that the local governments are not funded. Who funds the local government? They are supposed to be funded from the Imperial government. They have direct allocation to the Imperial government. I mean, for the Imperial government. But somehow, these allocations do not actually get to them. Oh, who's, who's withholding it? Um, I think they have, they have this uh, relationship with state government such that part of their money is used through the state government. So that, uh, especially when you have, um, what do you call them now? Caretaker. Okay, these transitions okay, from the So what happens there is so that the local government do not have enough funds to run local government. Mm -hmm. And the essence of local government's um, structure on tier of government is to deal with those basic issues of development at the local government level. Deal with rural roads, deal with uh, 
the a number of uh, other institutions. You know, be closer to the people, people yes. and be far more responsive to their plights and to their problems. And when they don't have enough money, that becomes impossible. So, um, we are going to grant the local government the autonomy that they, are, they were actually granted. What do I mean by that? We are going to allow them to have their funds. We need them to execute their responsibilities as a third tier of government. We are not going to be tampering with their, their location. Okay. Then, we are also going to, with that, they will do their, their local roads. I remember in the 90s, in the 80s, local governments graded most of the roads in Napa. All these roads, I mean, not the tagged ones, they were great. And when you grade, you create employment for party people. But that was one way of creating jobs for the party members. Okay. So they hardly have that anymore. Because they don't have the funds to do the grading. Once in the long while, they're giving little monies to just do something. Yeah. But in those days, in the 90s and the 80s, and um, or thereabout, you will see that the local government chairman will ensure that roads are built and give those contracts to party men or to your uh, um, to citizens from that local government to improve their economic situation. Okay. Okay. However, what we're talking about, what we're talking about is infrastructure development. So our government is going to see that the roads that are supposed to be graded are graded, and we are going to give the local government the revenues and their allocation to make them do that. Then beyond that is that the major roads the government is supposed to do, that we are going to embark on doing that. I want, I want we to are be going specific. to generate enough revenue. Uh, I'm sorry, ma, I'm not cutting you. I want to be specific because someone listening to you say, I, I, I will hold honorable, responsible for failing to fulfill the promise he made while granting liberty then in terms of only this you want to do Fox Road, you want to do Potaka Road, which of those roads is key? Okay, yes, the roads. tell me the roads that you're you're already aching to do for Abins. Um right now you know that federal government the incorrect many roads is the federal government road. Yeah I'm aware. The correct many um Abai correct is the federal government I'm road. aware. And that road has been very bad in many years. What do we need to do? I will use my money and repair that road and ask the government, the government for a refund. Okay. Why would I do that? Because I know the economic importance of that road to Abia State. People from Abia State, people from um, Apua Ibom, River State, Cameroons, and all of that come into Apua through, mm -hmm. through that road. Okay. Yes. Talk about Potakot Road right now. It has been awarded, but of course you know it's not been done. Potakot Road in Apua. Yeah. That is the road through which people could come into Apua from Potakot. The economy of Abia State is enhanced by people from River State, I mean Cross River, Upper Ibom, people from River State, then through Abo Oweri Road and uh, Oweri Road, you get to Onicha area, yeah. Enugu. So it is these people that make about what it is, make it that thick economic city. So once these roads are taken care of, Porta Control will ensure that that country that is given there is eventually executed. For uh, incorrect many road, we ensure that we liaise with the federal government to do the reform we wish to do it. Therefore, Abba Road had always screamed, that's Abba Ekore, Abba, uh, Abba Road. Yeah. The federal government had been doing that. I know that in my first tenor, as a head of assembly member, I kept screaming that the federal government should intervene on that road. A number of times they came to do some intervention, of course, soon after that it will wear out. People's goods kept falling, that tra uh, trailers and trucks kept falling, and there was so much wastage. So we are going to see that we are, we are we draw the government, the government to come and do those roads. Yeah, they're working on them now. You can see how slow they are. It's not it's not it's not really giving us what we want. Okay. So we are going to see that the road leading um Potakot Abba Road to Enugu or to Owen is done in such a way that people will not be uh, uh, I mean experiencing serious economic loss through the damages that are done to their vehicles or they are, they are trucks that fall and their goods pour away and get into so much wastage. And the accident that also occurred on the road. I know I had, I had to shout severally, asking if you are going to intervene. That they did, but we have to continue to shout and get them to do this. Yes, what I thought about Workers welfare? Yes, workers welfare is very key to my government. We have said that pensioners are, are old. These are people that commit, I mean, contributed their quota to the development of our society. We have said that once we get into government, by the first month into governance, we are going to schedule payment of pensioners and we start paying them off. Then we are going to also pay 50,000 naira minimum wage to Abians. 50,000 minimum not wage? Is, is, not that, is that feasible? Very feasible. Uh, because I, I know uh, I've been around Abia State and I know that people, when they tell you that if they actually pay 
the salary load at the state has with the current uh, allocation coming from the federal government that there will not be enough to actually execute contracts. So is, how, how are you going to manage this to do all this? That's what I said. That there has to be... You bring somebody who has character, you bring somebody who has integrity, you have bring somebody who has commitment to development, into governance. And that is what you're seeing in me. So what we are going to ensure is that there's transparency in, in management of our funds. We are not going to be spending our money on drinks and hotels. I'm not saying that not Does that do. happen? Of course it does happen. When you spend maybe 200,000 on a bottle of drink, how does that, how does that impact on, your, on your, your, your economy? So we're going to be very prudent. We're going to be very conscious of the fact that there are people who are who are in serious use and serious need of this fund. Very prudent in management, very transparent. And we are going to also, like I told, earlier, I told you earlier, see that those who are going to collect our revenues are not going to put them in their pockets. If you get all the, if you, if you get all the revenue that should accrue to the state, considering that you do the work you're supposed to do, we should never be able to not pay their taxes. Then you collect the revenues and collect them very well. Then you get all the federal allocations when you get all the grants that come from um, various international agencies and manage this well, you will develop ABIA, you pay pensioners, you pay salaries. So we have said we will pay 50,000 naira minimum wage and we pay on the 26th of every month. I am so glad to hear this. She yes. says she will pay 50,000 naira minimum wage and that will be getting into your account on the 26th of every month. That's a very lofty promise that we expect fulfillment because, you know, politicians are... With due respect to every politician out there, we do hear sweet talks during the time of electioneering, but when the things get going, that's when we begin to hear the, uh, the I allocations sat, are not I have my constituency for two terms, and as a legislator, I proved my own ways. I proved, I was able to attract a lot to my constituency. I was able to make laws in government, in the, in the House of Assembly. I was able to do my oversight. You cannot fault me in my responsibility as a legislator. So the way I acted, or perform in that responsibility as a legislator, I will do far better. And that's why I'm coming into, into executive position, where I can now be much more in control, where I'm not just going to be lobbying people to. Because you even pass a law, and it's not assented to. Even if it's assented to, it's not implemented. So it's just there. So in my the, the capacity as governor of the state, I'll be in a better position to now deliver. I'll be in a better position to, dis, to execute, and see that these things that bother me, become things of the past and Abians will be happy at the end of the day. Abians will be happy. So Honorable, before I go, I want you to talk to Abians now. Tell them what you're coming to do, what they're expecting. I don't even hearing you all this while, but I want you to make that promise and tell them right now what they should expect of you. Well, my dear Abians, my name is Blessing and I have come to be a blessing unto all Abians. I have come to transform Abians through the platform of the Social Democratic Party. Just vote for me. Vote for that horse, that white horse through uh, on which Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem. That is symbol of my party. Vote for SDP. Vote for Mrs. Mwaba, whom you know. You will see that Abia will transform. I encourage women to come out and vote. Encourage their fellow women, and you will see that Abia will be changed for the better for our husbands, for our children, and for the society in general. Thank you very much. And that's the sense of our program. Let's talk to I am Chukwu Jikemwagri signing off. Honorable, thank you so much for, having, for coming to our thank program today. Thank you so today. much. We are so glad. We have some other programs, of course. You can look up to our site, www.livingtvglobal.com.ng or go to our Facebook page at Living TV Global. Then you hear, you talk to us. We're going to respond swiftly. We are always there for you. Our programs are lined up. Don't go nowhere. Just watch out. We have a lot for you. For now, I see you all. Bye.